So um, we are filming this service. So if you know of someone that would like to see it, Chris is filming it. It'll be on our website if people are interested in this history. Let me pray. I'm going to turn it over to LD after I pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for a beautiful uh, Lord's Day and a wonderful homecoming. Thank you, Lord, that we can reminisce and appreciate a segment of the history of our church. And uh, Lord, just bless this time together, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Rick. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. As many of you, I hope, have an in interest in history like I do, and <clears throat> being raised in this church uh, means a great deal to me. I joined this church when I was nine years old, and it was after a summer of going to Bible school up at Chestnut Grove and Bible School here at Concord. And in those days, uh, that's, that's what us local kids did. And um, it was an integral part of my life at that point. And that's when I found Jesus. And we, we Nancy and I now are members of Farmville Baptist, and we occasionally go there. We, we go to... Uh, Heritage on Millwood Road. We come here. We have true friends up at Chestnut Grove and family that we visit up there. I wanted to say before I get started that <clears throat> the pastor in this church has tremendous faith, and I'm talking about Rick. He has faith to the extent not only does he believe in our Lord, but he asks an old man to do what I'm doing today. <laughs> and believe it or not, he has not called me to see if I remembered that I was supposed to do this. <laughs> now, that takes some real faith. <laughs> and for that, I am very, very thankful. I'm talking today or speaking today about the church that burned in 1953. And <clears throat> there are a handful of people in this church and in this community that remember their church. I, I really honestly can't remember the church. But through pictures and so forth, my imagination tries to tell me that I do. I do remember when the new church was built, which was only a year later, and the cornerstone being put in. But to get things off the ground, and I was hoping we'd just have a ton of young people here, but for those of you who don't know what I describe as young, anybody that's 70 or under <laughs> is, is young, so I, I am, I'm not talking about these, these young fellows here as they are greatly appreciated as well, but those of you that are under 70, I'm, I'm glad you're here. The, to give you some idea of what things were like on the Saturday night before this church, which was located right over here, burned, what people did in this part of the county they got ready for church on Sunday afternoon. It was pretty much a ritual. People didn't have running water. When you took a bath, you took a bath in a wash tub or in a little pan or a dish. It was a sponge, sponge bath. Then the thing that you would do is, is you would lay your clothes out to get ready to go to church. That's the way that we were raised. And if you were raised by your mother and father or your grandmother or grandfather, you laid your clothes out. Most kids in, in those days are not like we are now. I was looking around this morning. Who's got a pair of shoes on that you would polish? Anybody? <laughs> Most of us today don't know what polishing shoes is. But back in those days, you only had one pair of shoes, if you had any, and there may have been a pair of tennis shoes, kids, if you were rich, but some off-brand, 
uh, if you weren't rich, but if you did have a little pair of leather shoes, you'd worn them all week, and they had to be, sh shoes had to be shined up on Saturday night. And as Liz told me, Liz Manos told me, they had to be pretty much what we call spit shined. Everybody in those days uh, thought it was wonderful to have a shiny pair of shoes, or even have shoes, period. But in any event, that's what we did on Saturday night, and we went to bed and woke up that Sunday morning, and because it was October, we had to put a log on the fire and put some slab wood in the cook stove in the kitchen. We didn't have electricity in this area until 1947, when the uh, REA put electricity through here, so most people, if they had lights, they were truly blessed. To have an electric furnace or an electric stove was almost unheard of till later on. Running water, I don't even know if people out here had ever heard of running water till about 1957. I remember my grandmother's house burned and she built a house in 1957 and that was the first running water that I had heard of or can remember in this community. And she actually had an indoor bathroom. And of course, back in those days, people like Henry Falcher and his daddy that used to go to church here, Henry would tell me, he said, you know, not having a bathroom just meant we were blessed. I said, how is that, Henry? He said, well, if a bathroom all caught on fire, it would never burn the house down. So I said, well, that's probably something good, isn't it, Henry? <laughs> But anyway, Henry had always had a way of bringing us comfort, and I, I thought about him last night. We did go to a bluegrass concert at another church last night, and it was really enjoyable. Let me gather my thoughts here. When this church caught on fire that Sunday morning, I believe the gentleman that built the fire was a tremendous church supporter by the name of Ben Ballou, who lived just down the road on 608 in an adjoining property. And I had always thought that the church had a wood stove, but a, a gentleman here that's much more knowledgeable than I am by the, Jack, by the name of Jack Manus told me, no, it was a pot belly coal stove an old stove that was about this tall, and the chimney was on the interior of the church, and the old pipe ran up into the chimney. And I'm just speculating this, but it was probably the first fire of the year. It was in early October, and it may have been even before we had our first frost in those days. And I would imagine after all of those years of that old church being there, that the mortar had disintegrated. And when the heat of that fire touched that mortar, it pretty much crumbled. And I understand that Ben Ballou came back to check on the comfort level of the church and discovered that the church was on fire. Well, back in those days, Back in those days, we didn't have telephones out here. And I can't imagine where the closest telephone was. We, there may have been one at Dowdy's Corner, or may even have been one at Shepherd's Store, but I doubt it. But in any event, when the fire department was contacted, it was the Farmville Fire Department. And of course, the word that got to them is, the Concord Church is on fire. Well, would you believe, as things can happen, they were stopped half the way to Concord, Virginia, before they realized the fire was at Concord Church at Shepherd's. They were turned around, and in turn, they dispatched the Buckingham Fire Department to help them put the fire out at the church. The damage to the church was extensive. 
the old church had just gone through a renovation and there may be others here that can remember the church, but I cannot. But from the descriptions that I have read, the old church had beautiful stained glass windows in it, very much like this. The church had wainscoting on the walls, had plaster walls, it had all been recently restored. The interior, the outside of the church had been painted and it was in pristine condition with the exception of probably the chimney. And unfortunately, that beautiful church burned down. Kemper Beasley and I were speaking last Sunday and he shared with me that he spoke with his grandfather, Kemper Beasley, and I'll talk about Kemper a little more here lately, but if anyone knew this church, it was Kemper Beasley. And he said that he talked to his grandfather and they discussed whether or not this church had insurance. And if anybody knew, it would have been Kemper Beasley or Dr. Edgar Johnson or Cook Hicks who were heavily involved in the leadership of the church. And if Kemper didn't know, then it probably didn't have insurance. But I told Kemper this, I said, this church probably had the best insurance it could have ever had. It had a congregation, it had membership that loved this church, loved it to the extent that this church was their family. These four walls that were in that church and these people that came to church, all they truly loved. And that insurance is what built the new church in a year, which was absolutely phenomenal and unbelievable. Now, Nancy, I'm gonna start reading again because I've lost my place. And she told me, she told me not to read. But any, anyway, uh, anyway, I, I reminisce on my childhood quite a bit, and I was hoping a good friend of mine and a Facebook buddy and somebody that loves Elvis Presley was going to be here today, and her name is Marion Crump Rothgeb. Marion is a person that I truly love and grew up with, and Marion and I grew up in a little place two and a half miles through the wood from here, woods from here and four and a half miles around the road. And when we were young, we could cut through, but now we have to drive all the way around. But in that little community of Crump Town, where I was raised, we had the Crump family, the Wilkerson family, the Wood Woody family, the Townsend family, the Powers family, the Deadman family, the Higgins family, the Runyon family, the Woodall family, and the Coffee family, and I'm sure I missed somebody. But we lived in an area that was an absolute true blessing. And so many of those people that I grew up with were an integral part of this church, especially us kids. It was a ton of us kids. And we were so blessed to get to go to school together, go to church together, play together, play together, and, and, to, and, and as I said, worship together. And today I'm so pleased that I, I've got two of my first cousins here, Buddy Wilkerson and Rita Faye McFalls, and they're Buddy's wife and Rita Faye's husband. And I am just so proud that they could be here today. It makes me feel special because other than my wife and my children and grandchildren, these are my closest relatives. And for them to be here and to, to get them in this church gives me the hope that they will follow up what they're doing today. Some of the people that I had the pleasure of speaking with, and I know Rich, Rick, sent me out because he wanted me to do outreach to these people. <laughs> but
because there are so many people in this church that, believe it or not, are older than I am. I can offhand think of three people in this church that are 92 years old this year, and maybe four. But the first lady that I want to speak about is Mary Hicks. Mary Hicks is Cook Hicks's daughter. And Mary Hicks, at the time that the old church burned, was at the West Hampton College, which now is the University of Richmond, which is the institute, educational institution of Baptists here in Virginia, which strongly created the Baptist movement and thus created the church in Richmond. Many of the missionaries that served on the University of Richmond board were early Baptist missionaries, and some of them, their relatives, are actually buried here in this cemetery. And that's something I, if Rick wants me to do it, I'll do a little report, little report on that later on to give his church a little background in that movement. But I spoke to Mary Hicks, and she, she told me when she came home from college that Cook brought her here, and what she said was just absolutely devastating. She couldn't believe that her church had burned. Another person I spoke with is Catherine Morris, and went by to see Catherine, and I'll tell you, she made me feel 10 years younger because she is such an inspiration. What a wonderful lady she is, and uh, Catherine, told me that she grew up in Smyrna Church, and I don't know if many of you know where Johnny Beasley's service station was, or Spring Hollow store was, a Bates Market, and so forth, but Catherine was raised within about a half a mile from there, and I went to school with her brother, Ed Ayers, who is the director at the Revolutionary War Museum in Yorktown, and if you ever get a chance to go down there and see that, do it, because he'll give you a grand tour. But she told me that uh, she, she grew up in Smyrna Church, but when she married Earl, they started attending here. And what you see here is the, is the old church, and uh, I guess you can read that better than I can, but that's that's the only church we have, only picture we have found of the old church. But we have found three or four sources of that picture, and uh, Jennifer has laid these things out where they they really look great. the The next item I wanted to speak on was what Catherine mentioned to me about the church bell. As many of you know. There is a bell in the, in the, in the cupola here that uh, was given by the generous donation of my great-great-aunt, Ruth Marks Falp, who was married to Reeves Falp, who was my grandfather's brother. And the history, there she is, there's Aunt Ruth. And Aunt Ruth, when I was a, Great day, when I was in my 40s and 50s, she had the most beautiful white hair you've ever seen. Oh, it looked like pure cotton. And she was as sweet as the day was long. And she donated that bell to the church. Uh, what you're looking at there, that picture of Aunt Ruth is when she was a young girl Back in the early years of photography in this area, uh, Farmville and some other small places like Scottsville had photographers, and that's how they made their living. And they took, many years ago, gaguerre-type type pictures and so forth. But this particular picture was an invention that would promote sales in 1900 to about 1920, someone had come up with the come up with the idea. I didn't realize I could see it up here too. Uh, I didn't uh, that you could get your picture put on a postcard, and I actually have a picture of my mother when she was a baby on a postcard, and 
and I brought back to Rhonda, uh, uh, Roma, a couple of weeks ago, baby pictures that she had sent my mom and daddy, which had been revived over the years and became popular when, uh, when, when they had their baby. And I brought those back to her to give to her granddaughter. But this was a popular thing back then. Anyway, Aunt Ruth got that bell. I'm back. I can go, I can go forever and keep y'all confused. <laughs> Aunt, Aunt Ruth got that bell from a friend of hers that lived in Roanoke. And as you probably know, Norfolk and Western, which is Norfolk and Southern this year by a different name, had its headquarters in Roanoke. And somehow Aunt Ruth got a church bell that probably was off of a, a train and donated that bell to the church. Now, Dave, question. When was the old church built? The old church built, uh, it'll be 175 years next year. We, I don't think there is any definitive date on that. I think that is a date that the church has adopted even though the early records from what I have seen so far and what Jennifer has seen so far. Have you seen anything different, Jennifer? Wait, wait a minute. Now I can hear it. Can everybody hear the bell? Praise the Lord. Okay, dear. So it says tradition has it that Concord Baptist Church is organized in the rural community of Shepherds, Virginia in 1850. We say tradition because there is some disagreement as to the actual date. The earliest available source, the James River Dip Baptist Association minutes of 1857, has the date as 1856. This has changed in 1885 to 1850. Still, other dates appearing in the minutes are 1854 and 1859. And for most of y'all that uh, do any type of genealogy work, you know, if you try to figure out anything that happened in Buckingham before the quarters burned, it would be easier to walk back to Farville when you leave here today. It just, it just ain't there. And Kemper will probably tell you that. Those records are lost. And some rare occasions you may find something in the Library of Virginia, but in, in stuff that went back before 1761 when Buckingham was formed, you may find in Albemarle records and before that in Goochland, but the period that we're talking about is pretty much lost. The next person I spoke with is Shirley Morris, and you're talking about a wealth of knowledge. All of these people that I've talked to and met with just have so much knowledge about what's going on. Shirley told me that when she married Claude, she had been, before that, she had been attending Spring Creek Church. And I assume a lot of y'all know where Spring Creek is, but it's on the edge of Prince Edward in Charlotte. And I guess the official address is Darlington Heights. But at the same time, Spring Creek had experienced the same thing that Concord experienced. The church burned. And she was telling me all about that. Shirley has such a great memory. She told me that when the new church was built, that it would, they spent between $11,000 and $11,500 out-of-pocket money to build the church, but in addition to that, that did not include the manpower, the donation of materials and so forth, the timber that was donated and the manpower to cut the timber and to mill the timber and to design the church and so forth. Once that was done, the church was valued at roughly $28,000 and 
The church that was built was a colonial style building, seven classrooms, a spacious auditorium, and a balcony, of which I was telling Jennifer I wished her uh, grandfather had made it at least a foot tall, I wouldn't hit my head up there. <laughs> And she said she would have done it that way, too. And this church probably had features that most people out here had never realized could ever happen. It had two bathrooms and running water. I, I uh, also, in my visitations, went by to see Jack and Betty Manus. And one, one thing that always came to mind is when I was a kid, Right out here was two big oak trees that were roughly 10 feet apart. And in between those two oak trees was this concrete pad that was this wide, this tall, and five foot long. And I had always assumed that that block of concrete was a step that went to the old church. Well, little did I realize until Jack told me that, uh, that that block of concrete was actually goes back many, many years ago. That block of concrete was possibly where someone had stepped off of a horse when they rode it to church or got out of their buggy. The, the two oak trees that were out there on each side of this block of concrete, Jack said they had horseshoes nailed into them. And of course, those horseshoes were nailed into those two trees so you could tie your horse up when you came in here. And he said, well, they, they remembered it. I said, how did you remember that, Jack? He said, well, we remembered it when we were cutting the trees down and we took two chainsaw blades completely off of the saws when we hit the horseshoes. <laughs> So he said that that served as a great reminder that uh, what the purpose of those trees were and so forth. And Jack also told me that he could remember when he came up here to church in the mornings, a lot of times he would see an elder from this church by the name of Hugh Gills, who would always arrive at church early. I, I, I guess he's like my wife. He had, he had to go to everything at least 30 minutes early. And uh, of course, it didn't want to be the last one here. But Jack, Jack said that uh, he see Mr. Hugh Gill sitting out there on what I call the step, waiting for everybody else to arrive at the church. Hugh Gills and Mr. Henry Gills, for your information, even though I don't remember them, they were the grandsons of John Wilson Gillum, the gentleman that donated the original land for the church right here. That was their grandfather, and of which the old church was built. One thing I talked to Jack about, and over the years I have enjoyed a lot of different church histories and. I've even gone to where old churches were and have burned down and dumped some metal detecting and so forth. But one thing I've always come to realize, no matter where you put a church, you have to have a source of water. And I wondered, I said, Jack, where was the well? Jack said, wasn't any well. The well came here when they built a new church. Well, I said, well, you wouldn't put a church here unless you had water. He said, they had water. I said, where at, Jack? He says, right out here back of this playground, you go down the hill two to 300 yards, and there is a spring that pops at the ground. It's probably on Tommy's place now. And that is where the people would bring their horse for a drink of water before they arrived at church and get a drink of water for the horse when they left the church years ago. And the people in the congregation, I guess one of the deacons or one of the people that worked here at the church would take a, 
take a bucket and a dipper, that's what we drank out of back in those days, and get a bucket of water and a dipper and bring it to the church so people would have water when they came to church. And one thing, Jennifer, I'd like for us to do, if we can, get some of these young fellows to track down through these bushes <laughs> this year and, and see if that spring is still there and see if there's any rocks around it and get some pictures of that. But now I know the source for the water for the church. One thing that I also uh, checked on and wanted to find out about was, can y'all see that picture? I can't even see it. Still can't see it. But anyway, I hope y'all enjoy it. Any, anyway, I, that's a plat, isn't it, Jennifer? Is that a plat? And that's a plat of the church? Okay, plat of the church. Oh, okay, and that's and and, and 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 that's a great thing to know. Back in those days, I remember my grandmama taking me out to this one a couple of times and spanking me, so I knew where that one was. But it, but it, did she ever take you out there? You're good. I feel better now. I was still standing when I came. Yeah. Can you let believe Rick let them tear that down? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, when the church burned, uh, I tried to do a little research, and I thought maybe that uh, Bonnie Mae Walker was a custodian for Concord Baptist Church, and and I spoke spoke to Barbara, and Barbara told me her mama Bonnie Mae wife of Warren Walker Sr. was at the custodian until the 1960s. But this is Barbara, and this is Warren Walker and Warren's wife here today, and I am so pleased that they come out. These are my friends, and I've loved these people all my life. Warren is as old as I am. <laughs> Same age, I think. And I, I'm so pleased that they came today. One thing that I also learned was I knew we didn't get baptized in this little spring out back. I said, it's just not enough water. And I did a little research, and Jennifer found this out, I think, in a newspaper article. She did the research. We did our baptizing at Courageville Mills, and that is the old mill wheel at Courageville. Kurtzville Mills, uh, as many of you know, is at the bottom of the bottom of the road, bottom down at the river, beyond Kurtzville Schools. And Kurtzville Mills was originally built by the Ganaway family here in Buckingham County. And when the mill burned, my great 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 grandfather William Falp rebuilt that mill, and at the same time built Caserta which is the old Baldwin home on Route 15, right at Courageville. And they were actually built from the same brick kiln right between the house and the mill. He, William Falp, eventually purchased the mill. He was a builder and mill operator over the years and then eventually sold that mill. Well, the good, the good news was when this church burned, the leadership in this church was Reverend J.P. Leitner, and he served from 1948 to 1955, and he, he got the name, the visiting preacher, and I, when I first read that, I thought to myself, do they mean he just stayed such a short period of time and left? But that wasn't the case at all. That man had the outreach that this gentleman has in that he visited the community, the congregation, those were well, those that were sick, those that needed healing, those that needed consultation when they were getting ready to go see their maker. 
just like Rick does. And he did a great job. His, his record, Reverend Lightner, his record in 1953, this church had reached an enrollment of 244 people. And I think his outreach may have been akin to a man by the name of Jerry Farwell. Nancy just finished reading the life story of Jerry Farwell, and she's really easy on me. She tells me the important stuff because she knows I'm a slow reader. But she told me that Jerry Farwell's practice was to visit 100 families a week when he was a young man. And that is how he built his church and his university in Lynchburg. And Reverend Leitner, his attendance during those years was a testament to him in what he did and what he built. And some of the things that he did, I found this in the Farnborough Herald that in 1953, the Bible school had an attendance of 89 people. And that was, uh, and the average attendance was very, very high for that week. And some of the people that worked on that program was Reverend Leitner, Ms. Ben Ballou, Myra Bracy. I don't know if a lot of y'all remember the Bracy sisters or not, but they were all an integral part of this church. Sunday school teachers, disciplinarians for us young boys that couldn't behave, and lovely people. The uh, Miss Lois Piercy, Miss Ann Johnson, Miss H. F. Harris, Miss E. D. Singer, Miss Shirley Wooden, and it brings to mind that Bonnie passed away about a week ago, her daughter, who was a year younger than I am. Ms. Lula Crump, who eventually married Mr. Orange, and Ms. Ralph Repass, and she and her husband both have, have all passed. Ms. Leitner, Ms. Kemper Beasley, Ms. Claude Morris, Mrs. Rory Perkins, Miss Nanny Beasley. <laughs> Nanny hadn't gotten married at that point. Miss J. O. Hannah, where are you, Pat? Is that was that Bill's mama? J. O. Miss J. O. Hannah. No, that was on his father's side. On his father's side, okay. Um, Miss Bessie Hicks, who was Cook Hicks's sister. Ms. Silby, and I'm trying to figure out if that's Ms. Joe Silby, uh, who lived in the community, it doesn't give a first name. Ms. L.D. Farb, Ms. Floyd Wilkerson, who was Buddy and Rita Fay and my grandma. Uh, Ms. Herbert Wilkerson, who was Buddy's mama, and Ed Singer. They were all involved in Sunday school that summer. The uh, thing I also wanted to mention was some of these guys in this picture up here, I'm skipping around, they're gonna shoot me up there, but some of the people that are in this picture include some of the great leaders of the church in those days. And it was, I just happened to mention Cook Hicks and Dr. Edgar Johnson, and they were installed as deacons in 1948. Another great leader of the church was Kemper Beasley, and, and as tradition has it, things seem to be continuing to go that way, even with a young fellow with a mighty pretty blue coat on today. <laughs> and uh, his, his great-great-grandpa was his superintendent here in 1925 as a young man. That's a hundred years ago. And he served as that role again for 14 more years 
back during this period that I'm talking about right now. I talked about the church being remodeled and the church was so proud of their accomplishments when the old church had been remodeled and of course when they had the fire and these are some things that were pointed out to me by Joanne Showalter. Joanne is much younger than I am and I don't know how she remembers all these things but she, she must have a brilliant memory. But uh, actually, we, we're pretty close to the same age. We're both 57. <laughs> um, after the fire, they had the remains of soaked hymnals, blistered benches, soaked and warped piano, some stained pulpit furniture, and Joanne told me she could remember and I, I remember this. When they built the new church here, the old benches were put into the church until these new benches were affordable by the church. And one picture, I don't know if it's come up there yet or not. One picture when you, there you can see, that's that young man, and I was hoping he was gonna be here today. That young man looking back on the left-hand side is T.C. Beasley, and I think he was afraid he was going to miss something. And, <laughs> and, and I've known T.C. all my life, and I wish he could have been here today so I could pick on him, because he, he's a good guy. But do, Kemper, don't you tell him I said that. Anyway, at this point, I want to call on a wonderful friend of mine, a person that brought me a lot of comfort the other day when I went by to see her, and she said she wanted to tell you all a few things about the church too. Liz Manus. Can I stand right here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I want to tell you. Hey, I'll Mr. let you face them. Mr. Leitner was the minister that baptized me. I had already been baptized in the Presbyterian Church, but he, when I came here, he baptized me. Well, I want to add, some of the same things that's been added today, but I've got it written down, so I'm going to add it. Um, what a sad day in October 1953, in the quiet community of Concord Baptist Church, the church had been newly remodeled, burned, and could not be repaired. Ben Ballou, a member of Concord, lived close by, had come a little earlier to start a fire to help cut the chill of the fall morning. I lived just a mile from the church as did my mother, Mary Kidd Singer, my daddy, Massey Singer, and I had one sister, Sue, and a brother, Tommy. Um, my sister and I, the morning that the fire, and I were in uh, our bedroom getting ready for our services at New Store Presbyterian Church, which my family were members, when all of a sudden, a fast-moving vehicle came roaring into the driveway of our uh, home with the horn making all the noise it could. My sister and I ran out of the, uh, our bedroom when a gentleman was running up the front steps of my home and said, uh, screaming, your church is on fire. <clears throat> Excuse me. When he said, your church, I said, wait a minute. Then he pointed, I said, we have three churches in a short distance. And he said, what well, it was on, uh, he pointed south on 636. And I said, that is Concord Baptist Church. My sister Sue and I ran as fast as we could around the, our home and we got the message to mother and dad 
And in short time, Daddy had the old car ready to roll, and we came down uh, to see what the situation was here. When we arrived at Concord, we were the first ones there, but in just a very short time, Ben Ballou, which was my mother's uncle, came back between um, my mother and her uncle. They were able to get a few things of the church through a window opening with Uncle Ben um, on the outside of the church window, and my mother stayed inside of the dangerous church building, carrying, carrying what she could, and Uncle Ben was at the window to receive it. I can remember so well seeing my mother picking up the large, heavy Bible from the pulpit and running to the open window where a window was once, and Uncle Ben was waiting to take the Bible from her. This was the last thing that was taken from the church that morning. I was there, I know. <laughs> um, and by this time, uh, timbers were falling from the ceiling, and there was a lot of smoke. My sister, sister uh, Sue, which was a few years younger than me, we were calling out to, over to, to mother, hurry up, hurry up. The whole church is burning. This, uh, this scene, I believe, will always be implanted in my memory. This time in history, there were limited telephones available, and because of this, it was difficult to get the news to, to everyone. Just got one more page. <laughs> <laughs> when the family uh, started coming to the church that service mo morning, most had uh, no idea what they would be facing that morning. The sad news had not reached them. Concord Baptist Church has been an instrument of service in the kingdom of God for the past 174 years. It is our hope, our prayer, and our aim that this she will continue to be a good and faithful uh, send out. And this is submitted by Elizabeth Singer Manus on August 11th, 2025. Thank you, Liz. Okay. And, and this is that Bible that her mama saved from the church. And what a prayer, what a blessing it is. I knew your mama. I can remember her going, and it was already too dangerous. Right. Nothing would stop her. And I would sit down and see her taking the Bible from the pulpit and going just a short distance to a wall here that the window was already blown up. right here. Her mother, <clears throat> if you didn't know her mother, her mother was a one of the hardest working people I ever met. She lived to be 99 years old and I thought she was going to live much longer than that because she had such a work ethic and determination and had such an outreach about her. On the worst day of your life you could go see her mom and she'd cheer you up. She was a great lady. 
the back on the new church, uh, Concord was really blessed uh, under the leadership of Reverend Leitner. This man had, had vision. He wanted to see this new church be a brick church. He wanted to see this church built properly, and I, I haven't seen a crack in the walls yet. And you can't say that for many facilities that has been around since 1954. They, uh, they put in new, uh, the pulpit was enlarged, new furniture was bought, glass windows put in, painted inside and out. The church was in beautiful shape. During, uh, I'm skipping around, during this period when the church did burn, the new store, not new store, Chestnut Grove Church reached out to Concord and because Concord and Chestnut Grove shared Reverend Leitner with two other churches and Chestnut Grove's outreach was wonderful. They told the membership of this church that they could utilize their church because services weren't being, church preaching was not being conducted every Sunday, but Concord decided that uh, at that point they would uh, go to Courageful School to have their services. Well, Courageful School in 1954, I was in the first grade at Courageful School, and that's the only year that I went to that school. And the next year I went to Dillwyn Elementary School, and during that same year, this church was, was blessed to be able to use that school facility for its church meetings. And, and, it, and it may have been a good outreach because it may have reached other people in the, uh, in the county. That's, that's Reverend Leitner, if I can see that far. That's, huh? It, that's Will Wade, okay. Anyway, um, all of this rebuilding was done under the leadership of Dr. Edgar Johnson, who was chairman of the board and head of the deacons. And much of this, uh, much of this structure here was under the oversight of Lathan Falls, who who was employed in the building industry and the uh, parts industry in Farmville, I guess at the time through Farmville Manufacturing Company, if my memory was, was right, as I remember him being in there years ago, and he, he had the knowledge and the forethought to lead the church in the uh, utilizing plans and so forth to determine what type of wood products and so forth they would have. Uh, much of the timber was donated by the uh, Gills family and the Orange family in Buckingham County. And that timber for this new church was cut by church members in to a great extent by Jack's, Jack Manus's family, uh, with his dad being a leader back then. Jack and his brothers were a bunch of young fellows, and daddy was, uh, daddy was in the timber cutting business, and many in his family and others in this church, this church cut the timber, and the timber was taken to Walter Fender's sawmill which today is in between what was Johnny Beasley's service station and um, White Oak Grove Church, Oak Grove Church, where the county refuse facility is right now. Walter Fender had a sawmill there, and I found that in a record even though I can't remember it, but uh, I remember 
Mr. Fender, and I remember Johnny Beasley and, and all of that. Um, as I mentioned, Lathan, Lathan Falls would tell them what timber to cut at that mill to, to put together this church, the superstructure of this church. And for that, we were blessed. And we could use newly cut timbers, most likely oak, where in today's world, it's either plastic or pine. So this place is constructed well. I spoke also with Jennifer about if, what the possibility of her knowing who may have been, who served as the contractor for this church. And she spoke with her uncle, Wayne Falls. Well, Wayne Falls and TC are a year older than I am. And I was hoping, like I said, they were gonna be here today so I could remind them of that, but they're not. So please get the word to them. But Wayne said the word that he thinks that a gentleman by the name of Buford Monroe from Lovingston, Virginia, Nelson County, built this church. And I think the person that did the brickwork, if my feeble memory serves me, was a Mr. Sprouse. And he may have been a local Sprouse from the Sprouse's over at Sprouse's Corner, but I'm not sure of that. And as time goes on and as we do work towards next year's program, maybe we can continue to discover these types of things. But while this work was going on, the, the contractor and Dr. Johnson and the other leaders of this church were very much astute on what to do to save this church money. These people who worked on this church actually stayed in a portion of the old church while they were building the new church in order to save time, money, traveling, housing, etc. I'm not sure how they got fed. Maybe the church fed them, I don't know. But uh, those types of things, the, the people in this church worked very hard to get their church up and going. The, that, that's well weighed. Okay, I'm going on the next, after Reverend Leitner resigned in 1955, and he had a field of churches, as I'd mentioned before, which included New Hope, Liberty, Chestnut Grove, and Baptist. When he, when he resigned and he was replaced by a young gentleman by the name of Will E. Wade, and he was a ministerial student at the University of Richmond, and uh, he was ordained in 1956. And um, at the same time, T.M. Manus, Ben Ballou, and Frank Orange were installed as deacons and Walter Fender. And um, Mr. Wade was the pastor of the church when the benches that had been salvaged from the church were replaced with these new benches. And I can remember that as well as the church was trying to do outreach to, they had a brand new church, a beautiful church that had blistered benches in it that many had been water soaked and damaged and they wanted to place appropriately in here something that would really look nice and serve the church well. And I'm telling you, just standing here looking at them. Rick says they're in good shape and I agree. And it's through a generous blessing that Mr. Weddington also saw a lot of times when preachers were doing a good job and people were squirming and a lot of people thought it was because the preacher was making them squirm. It was actually because these benches were so hard. <laughs> Mr. Weddington donated these cushions and now you don't have to squirm so much. One thing I wanted to uh, to mention, and uh, what's, on, what's on the back of these benches, and this was done 
in order for the church to express its appreciation to those members and so forth that had the ability at that time to donate to purchase these new benches. And I went around and uh, put these down and uh, should be a slide that has them on there. And But the first one up here says, presented by the young people of Concord BTU. The second is in memory of Jacob C. Bursch, church clerk, 1925-34, and also Sunday school superintendent. Uh, Jake Bursch was Lathan Falls in Lehman Falls, Jennifer's grandfather's father, who, uncle. uncle uncle that they came to live with when they lost, when Lathan and Lehman lost their mother, they came to live with Jacob Bursch here in Buckingham County. And from that happening, uh, they, they were part of this church and, and this church was blessed with the service that was given by that family over the years. The, uh, Ma'am. I was gonna say I told Jennifer this and Elaine already knows, but Lathan was raised in my house. Lathan was the verses used to own my house. And so we remodeled it, but that's where he grew up. That's where they grew up and it's down on the Willis River close to the old mill. Yeah. What was the name of it? The mill. It's the name of the road down there. Evans, it's on Evans Mill Road. Evans Mill Road in Buckingham County. Yeah. So he was a good man. <laughs> Rick, Rick wanted y'all to know that, and I agree with that too. My daddy was raised on the Willis River as well, and he and Lathan used to swim together in Lehman when they were young boys. This was probably back in the 1930s. Uh, what, the next plaque on the bench was to Reverend Leitner, and it was donated by Frank Beasley, Kemper's uncle. And uh, the next one was donated in memory of my mother, Mary Jane Webb, by S.C. Allen. And this is your, Mary Jane Webb is your great, great, great grandmother of charities. And she, I'm guessing, is buried in Sevierville, Sevier County, Tennessee, where they, Sweden Allen, and his wife Sweet. came from. Yeah. They're, they're buried here. They're buried right here, but this is to her, Sweden's wife's mother, and she's back in Sevier, Tennessee. The next uh, was presented in honor of Mr. and Mrs. Houston Beasley by their children and and most of y'all don't know, or, or if you do know, the Beasley was a very, very large family. And uh, Houston was one of the boys, and I might tell this later, but I'll, I'll tell it now. Some, someone told me Houston was standing in front of the church one day, and, and he was talking to Mr. Manus, who was the chairman of the cemetery committee. And they were standing out here and looking over at the cemetery and Houston said, you know, we're standing over here looking over there and one of these days we're going to be over there looking back this way. I think we need to do something about the cemetery. 
And I'll tell you a little bit later, that's how homecoming came to be at Concord Church. I'll tell you about that here in a minute. And the people here have always had a wonderful outreach. And Mr. Manus, who was the chairman of the, super, of the cemetery committee, at that point in time, they did an outreach to the R.J. Hudgens family who lived just down the road, off the road here, the old brick colonial home that most of y'all probably never seen, maybe Claude Jr. has, but the old Hudgens place, they donated an acre of land to go with the cemetery here, and Mr. Manus in the, in the church committee fixed it up fixed the cemetery up and uh, back back on these uh, back on these plaques the next one was the young people of the BTU the next was Thomas B Hicks and that's Thomas Bocock Hicks and his wife Susie and daughter Bessie uh, Thomas Bocock Hook Hicks was Cook Hicks's father and his mother was Susie the next is Mr. and Mrs. F. M. Wilkerson. That's Francis Marion Wilkerson, who's buddy and my great grandfather. And this was donated by our grandpa and Uncle Ray that Buddy was named after, and in addition to his dad. And Francis Marion Wilkerson is buried in Appomattox. He was a Civil War soldier and died in 1899. And his wife moved down here in 1900 and started attending this church. The next person is to my brother Calvin Beasley by John Webb Beasley. And Johnny operated the service station. He was another Beasley brother, Kemper's brother, and Houston's brother, and Nanny's brother, and on and on. Big family, wonderful family, uh, Earl and Frank and I can go on and on. A lot of family members. The uh, next one was in memory of father and mother, Sylvester V. and Eliza Webb Beasley by Nanny Prophet. Nanny Prophet and Kemper and Houston's, all of them's uh, mother was my great grandmother's sister. And they were all a sister to the Morrises up at Chestnut Grove, so I can't say anything bad about anybody around here. Uh, yeah, I just get me in trouble. The, the next one is in memory of Grace Kelsey by Frank Kelsey. Grace Kelsey is a lady, I don't remember Grace, but she, she died in 1955, and there is a picture of her, Jennifer, in the 1947 Farmville Hurl I found this week of a Kelsey family reunion that was taken at Appomattox PE Church where all of the Kelseys are from. They had to be distant cousins and it's a picture of, of Grace and Frank in that picture. Hopefully we can do some more research down the road. They came here I read somewhere, maybe from South Dakota, and moved back here, but she must have been one inspirational lady for the circle to be named after her in this church. The next is in memory of Luther Crump. Luther Crump was, I, mean, I was hoping Marion Crump was gonna be here, but Luther was the uncle of great uncle of Marion and Betty and Billy and Elaine and Frank and Sonny and all of the Crump kids over there. He was a brother to Harvey Crump, who was their grandfather. The next person was the uh, in honor of the uh, BTU by Mr. and Mrs. Walter Fender. Next was in memory of J.V. Marks. Mr. Marks was Ruth Marks Fop's father. She, he was Clyde Marks' father from down in the Buckingham Springs, Kurdsville area. And they had a pretty large family down there as well. 
John Wesley Townsend was uh, the matriarch Townsend in this community. He was J.C.'s grandfather and all of the Townsends uh, either were brothers or nephews or nieces of his. Uh, one of his nieces, uh, I believe, was Hazel Woody or maybe a sister to John Wesley Townsend. And I guess that takes care of the plaques. Um, The church next year will be celebrating its uh, 175th anniversary, and I'm hoping items can be, be discovered between now that will involve the old church and, and the new church and can be added on to what we've discovered so far. This church has a very, very rich history and as time goes on, most people realize it's very, very difficult to, to gain the knowledge of history because uh, in, in recent generations, we, we have the impression that history needs to be destroyed. But history is what we learn from, be it good or be it bad. If it's good, we want to accentuate it. If it's bad, we don't want to repeat it. But if you don't know what history is, you can't benefit from it. And that's something that uh, we all t need to remember. I want to also say that um, I want to thank everybody for staying here for this presentation. Rick didn't give me 88 minutes, so. I'm not going to keep you here as long, but uh, he knows I don't have a watch. I, when I retired, I threw my watch away. <laughs> but anyway, I, I do want to say one important thing. Jennifer, would you stand up, please? This is Jennifer Flowers Davis, and she's Lathan Falls' grandchild and Elaine Falls' daughter. And without her and her abilities in this PowerPoint, of which I didn't even talk about the one she did about the cemetery looking back at church a minute ago. But I, that, that is a work of art. And I can tell you, latch on to this young lady because she is a real resource for this church. And she is young, she is energetic, and she is talented. And with that, I'd like to thank you and ask Mr. Sanger if he would lead us in a prayer. So, would you like for me to do it, Ray? Yeah, I wanted to thank y'all too. Let me do that and I'll hand it back to you. Okay. Um, I really appreciate the work that uh, they put into this. And uh, next year is going to be a big year. Uh, the second Sunday in August of 2025, 175 years. Um, and I appreciate Jennifer and LD, and I know they're gonna to continue to do work, and it's gonna be a big celebration next year. Uh, the plan is to open up the cornerstone out there, the curiosity of figuring what's in it, and then I think we'll put some stuff in it too. If Kemper wants to, young Kemp wants to be a part, and Mally, they'll be able to be a part. We've got a picture of LD standing out on the porch when he was young and uh, y'all will be able to put stuff in it and so uh, keep that in mind and i do want to give both ld and jennifer a hand if y'all will join me the work they put into this <laughs> and what ld just said is is true a lot of times we lose our history because we don't appreciate it this is important some people look at this oh they're just facts it's just, we live in the present and we're living no uh, these people that built this church, it took a lot of faith when the church burned down. It took a lot of people to sacrifice. You're talking about insurance. They didn't have it. And, you know, and we say we'll just forget them. To me, that's the epitome of arrogance because we're here because those who went before us, we're able to have a church in this county 
and minister in this county because these people, when the church burned, they didn't just sulk and have a pity party and go somewhere else. They rebuilt. And I think they deserve a hand. I mean, I really do. I know they're not here, but uh, and, uh, anyway, I, uh, I want to turn it back over to LD to close us. But again, we thank these two especially for the work they've done. If you will, uh, please bow your head. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this homecoming celebration. Dear Lord, and I wanted to mention that the reason that we have homecoming here, dear Lord, is because our church burned. And when this new church was built, the week after the cornerstone was put in, was declared as homecoming. And that day was declared so that the funds could be raised to revive the cemetery here at the church and to take care of it forever. Dear Lord, we have been blessed by that decision and by that action. Dear Lord, thank you for these wonderful people that came here today. Bless our country, bless our church, and dear Lord, do everything you can to inspire the young people to be a part of us. Amen. Yes, ma'am.